Welcome back, folks, to the St. Lawrence Network Community Channel. We hope you're all doing okay out there. This is our third show, and we really hope you enjoy it. Here are a few updates from around town. If you were in Isaac's Clover Farm this week, you'll see they really changed things up as they try to protect themselves, and us, of course. It's one-way traffic only now as you move about the store, and only 10 customers allowed in at a time. Now, as if the staff needed another job to do, now they have to count heads. They've really stepped up the home deliveries and curbside pickups, which is keeping people out of the store and at a safe distance. So feel free to call in your order and they'll deliver or you can pick it up outside the store. Way to go, Johnny and the crew. At the gas station, they installed glass barriers inside. So the doors are open to the public again, with distancing rules, of course. Yet if you feel more comfortable, you can still be served at the window. Gas went pretty low, but it's back to 85 cents a liter. Of course, only the consumer is celebrating this fact because it's not good for Newfoundland or any other economy that depends on oil revenue. The St. Lawrence Soccer Association had a very busy week and the boys sure got their exercise. They received a large shipment of food products from Kraft Heinz in Ontario to distribute on the Buren Peninsula. It all started with a conversation between Hubert Beck and his niece. She's a Laurentian, of course, and she works at Kraft Heinz. And I was expressing my concern that, uh, uh, you know, like uh, this coronavirus has pretty much brought uh, a powerhouse province like Alberta to his knees. What is it going to do to Newfoundland? I said, I'm seeing the effects of it in the small community now. And, yeah. and I said, I certainly uh, feel bad for people that uh, have lost their jobs. And, and, you know, I didn't know at the time that the fish plant was going to open or not. So. She said to me that sometimes she said we donate food to the local food banks. And I, I casually said, well, too bad we can't get some of that down here, even though we do have uh, regional food banks in Marystown and Bjorn. And she said, well, I'll see what I can do. She said, I might be able to send a couple uh, pellets of food down your way. And uh, if I can, can you uh, do distribution on it? And I said, well, I almost certainly will. I said, oh. So this is the first truck uh, that we're heading to the regional food banks in Marystown, which service uh, out of Bjorn Peninsula. So we're sharing the, the bulk of the material with them because they reach out a lot further than I can and they're more organized. So that's how it came to be and uh, so as you can see we got some people here uh, loading and we're practicing social distancing the, the best we can. And we're wearing masks and gloves and uh, we're going to drive in separate trucks down to Marystown. And then we're going to, we got some people on the other end with us and we're going to unload and hopefully uh, it'll benefit some of the people uh, on the Bureau Peninsula. I'm sure it will. I know. Uh, the donor was Kraft Heinz. Okay. Uh, Linda Beck Voter, who is uh, Laurentian, yeah. uh, works in their distribution department. And so that's where it all started, really. And what, what went from me having a concern for some local people down under luck yeah. to get maybe a couple of pellets of food come on a truck, went to us getting a 40 foot sea can coming by Ocean X, yeah. who, by the way, also donated out of freight for free. It was wow. almost uh, just under $7,000 for getting shipped down. So wow. they donated out for free, and they showed up here. Thursday morning with it, and uh, as you can see, uh, when you get some pictures later in the rec center there, we still got a lot of food to uh, distribute throughout the Grand Peninsula, and some of it, for for example, may end up getting put in trucks and gone back to St. John's because we got large amounts of some yeah, items, like right. we got 4,000 bottles of ketchup, so yeah. we don't need 4,000 bottles of ketchup. In this show, we're trying to take a look up close at some of the things going on around us things that sometimes we don't know are there, or we simply don't think about as we go about our busy lives. The rocks around us, for example, the basis of our mining industry. Norman Wilson likes to look really up close at rocks and minerals, and he's about to show us what floor spar ore is made of. Norman is a metallurgist who came to St. Lawrence in 1997 working with Bjorn Min Minerals at the time. He had retired by the time the new mine opened, but he works as a consultant with CFI. He's a specialist in mineral processing. The St. Lawrence mine produces a product for the market that is nearly 98% pure floor spar. In order to get that 98%, that means figuring out how to extract all the unwanted minerals in the ore 
leaving only the floor spar. The process begins with knowing exactly what minerals are there, even in very small quantities. And this is where Norman's expertise comes in. By knowing what minerals need to be removed, he can recommend fine-tuning the milling process so that these minerals will float or sink, separating them from the floor spar. So Norman spends a lot of time with a microscope, studying ore samples to identify the various minerals in the rock. He does this by studying the crystal structure of the mineral, which doesn't change from one sample to another, something like our DNA structure. To make it all more interesting, Norman has a camera in his microscope that can capture images of these crystal structures. And the result is nothing short of spectacular. This is called microscopic photography. The pictures you see here show the various minerals that exist in the St. Lawrence rock, along with the floor spar. And you are seeing their crystal structures up close. Keep in mind that these images taken through a microscope are smaller than the head of a matchstick. Most of these minerals appear only in minuscule quantities, but as beautiful as they are, they must be removed in the milling process. Here is pure floor spar in its crystal form, and the rest are all its neighbors. Quartz is the most plentiful mineral next to floor spar at about 5%, and the rest appear in very small quantities. In a future episode, we hope to visit the mine and milling operation to see how it all works. And we're hoping that Norman might be our guide and show us around. Meanwhile, if you want to see more of Norman's microscopic images, uh, check out the link below in the description for this video. This website is where mineralogists around the world share images and other valuable information and have fun debating each other's finds. Now we are ready to sail for the horn. Way Good morning, folks. Carl Slaney, Laurentian Legacy Tours. This morning, I'm in Little St. Lawrence the little town with the big history. This harbor is an amazing location for the early days of the fishery, and the Europeans have been here for 400 years. They came to fish off these shores, the Basque, the Italians, the French, Spanish, English, Irish, and more. They found Little St. Lawrence to be the perfect location, close to the fishing grounds, well protected by Turpin's Island, and two rivers empty into this harbour, delivering a great supply of fresh water. A few stories of this area are well known, but many unknown, and last forever to time. While poking around on Google over the last few years, I discovered the story of a royal visit in July 1786. The story is told in this sketch, that came from the vessel's logbook. I think this is an amazing sketch of the harbour and of Turpin's Island and what it was like in those days. The vessel was the Pegasus, an English warship, a 28-gun frigate mastered by Prince William Henry, the future King William IV of England. The Navy ship of war was in effect a travelling courthouse the Captain Prince acted as a surrogate judge. This was in the early days before local government was in place in Newfoundland. She was under British rule and ruled locally by unelected English fishing admirals. A rough system of justice was in place to keep Britain's law and order in this new found land. J. S. Mayers a crew member of the Pegasus made several other sketches of this area showing Cape Chapel Rouge, Great St. Lawrence Harbour, Soccer Head, Fairyland Head, and more. On the island is Newman and Company Trading Station, 
established in 1784 and operated there until 1810. The prince spent four days in Little St. Lawrence, but there was no need to dispense justice. In a letter to his father, King George III, the prince wrote, The Guernsey and Jersey people settled in these parts are peaceable and well-behaved. The letter was not so flattering to the folks in Pacentia, the next port, to get this version of floating justice. As you can see, the folks of Little St. Lawrence have a long history of being law-abiding, civilized crew. Actually, today, the people of Little St. Lawrence continue to be the finest kind. Thanks, Patty and Michael, for doing these shows and allowing these stories. Take care, be well, and please God, we'll talk again soon. Eggs are the promise of new life and an important part of the Easter resurrection theme. So for Easter, we thought we would visit some chickens. These guys are a recent addition to Hannah Walter's family. Her children are now learning to care for these creatures that produce their morning eggs. This is a small backyard operation, so there are only four hens and a rooster named Larry. It turns out Larry has a little problem. He barely says a word, so he's no alarm clock. Of course, the hens were not entirely happy with the rooster, so they went looking for a solution. Now they've got Larry watching all kinds of YouTube tutorials so he can find his cock a doodle doo. In the last hundred years, our ancestors faced not one world war, but two, and they prevailed in the worst kind of circumstances. The song Lily Marlene was popular on both sides of the conflict in World War II. Perhaps the sacrifices and endurance of our ancestors can bring us some perspective now on how to contend with today's uncertainties. The bottom line, together as a community with good cheer and our hearts strong, we can handle just about anything. We know there are all sorts of talented people in St. Lawrence area, and we'd like to get a look at what they're doing and show it off in the light of day. I think these people can inspire us and maybe offer us a lesson or two. So whether you paint pictures or you rebuild cars, we might come looking for you. Edith Clark was my first target. She says she's been drawing since she was a kid. 
Of course, she put all the artistic stuff aside when she was raising a family and working. But then she retired and she took up painting. She experiments with different painting styles and techniques all the time and says the internet is a wonderful place to learn since there are tutorials on just about anything you want to know. Edith says anyone can paint if they have a glimmer of interest or talent, especially if they use the internet and other such tools that are available. As a painter, she's inspired by animals the most, and she finds a lot of joy in painting them. She doesn't pick up her brushes every day, but when she does, before she knows it, it's supper time. Completing a piece of art is quite satisfying, she says, even though sometimes it's a struggle to finish and she wonders if the piece is worth finishing. Edith is the grandmother now, so she also likes to paint rocks with her grandchildren. And of course, like all kids, they're only too happy to collect rocks from the beach. Ultimately, she says painting is her way of relaxing and relieving the stress of everyday life. Now, of course, she also hopes it might keep some brain cells working to ward off dementia because she's hoping for a few good years of painting yet. No doubt parents are delighted to have their children at home full time, yet they continue to find things to do with them. Tristan is three and he learned how to ride a bike this week. Look out now, buddy. Hunter appeared on the scene this week. He started off the week low key with a little baking, but the truth is Hunter is a man on the go. Hunter is not finished yet. Apparently there's something interesting in behind the school. We checked in on a few of our seniors around town and they appear to be doing just fine. A couple of them were a little shy, but that's only because we caught them in their pajamas. We're having some beautiful days and evenings, and it's great to see people out walking and enjoying themselves. Look at that, would you? Carl Tarrant, King of the Road. That dog is big, but he's just a pup. So this is his first time in the water. That's it for this week. Remember, if you like the show and would like to see more of it, please hit the subscribe button. That way you won't miss anything and we'll have a good idea how much interest there is to keep the show going. And an extra special thank you to the guys on the outskirts of town, keeping us all safe from the zombies. <laughs> Tea.